Good morning, family and friends, and welcome to Bahia United Methodist Church Online. Well, here we are again, week two of our new normal. And we at Bahia United Methodist Church pray that, the, that you're remaining strong in the Lord and full of hope. Our God is great, and our God is good, and he will see us through these uncertain times, and that I am sure of. It's times like this that the world can truly see what the, ch the church is really all about. So, are you filled with worry, fear, frustration? Or are we people of faith and hope and love? If you have a specific prayer request, comment below. If it's appropriate, let us pray with you right now. And if, if you feel like you just need something deeper, please go to our online or private email at prayer at bahiaumc.org. If you are not on our church email, uh, e-newsletter, um, call us at the church and let us know. We'll be happy to add you. Um, there's some great information in there, and it'll also give us an extra opportunity to pray with you. Um, the finance committee reached out to me this week and asked me to thank all of you who mailed in your, your giving and those of you who took advantage of the online giving. And if you need instructions on that, again, please call the church office and we'll be happy to give you um, directions on how to move forward. We're also trying to stay connected here at the church by making phone calls and texts, sending Facebook messages. We're also beginning to gather our life groups back together again online through, a, through an app called Zoom. Our life group did it this week. It was awesome. We got to see each other's faces. We got to pray for one another, hear each other's needs. Um, it's a wonderful way to reach out. Our life kids, I'm told our life kids met this morning. So if you would like uh, an invitation to join one of those, please let us know through the church office. And most likely, our life group leaders will be reaching out to you. Um, let's see. I think that covers just about everything um, right now. If you will join with me as the light of Christ and God's word in our space. And let's worship with awesome God and praise him more.
even in difficult times. For instance, listen to Psalm 3. Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. But you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, the one who lifts my head high. I call out to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy mountain. I lie down and I sleep. I wake again, because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear, though tens of thousands assail me on every side. Arise, Lord, deliver me, my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. From the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. We serve a great God who is a good, good Father. Let's continue to worship Him this morning.
singing how good and perfect our Father is. I sure hope you were. No matter if you're in your lounge pants or if you got up and got dressed like I've heard some people have already done, like they were going to church. I'm glad you're with us this morning. We're going to come to a time of prayer this morning. And I, as I do, I want to remind you that we're a community of prayer, we're a community of faith, that the body of Christ is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And so, as such, it doesn't matter where we are by distance, that we are together in Christ. And so, we're going to pray together in a minute, our, our family prayer. But I'm also going to include part of our prayer this morning, a prayer that I, I actually posted on our Bahalia United Methodist Church page, which you can read later if you'd like, but it, was, it came from uh, you version. Um, but I want to pray that, incorporate that in our prayer this morning before we have our family prayer. So would you go with me now to our Father in prayer. Good morning again, good, good Father. You are truly a great God and a good God. We love you. We thank you for giving us another sunrise, another day. You didn't have to do that, but you chose to do that. Because you love us, because you're a giving God, you're a forgiving God, you're a merciful and gracious God. We are so thankful that we can come together in spirit, if not in person, and we can come together and worship you this morning, this day, because it is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. We are thankful that you never leave us, nor you never forsake us. And no matter what our condition, no matter our financial, our physical, our spiritual condition, you never leave us nor forsake us. You are close at hand. You, your word tells us to draw near to you, and you will draw near to us. And we are so thankful that we can come together collectively and sing your praises this morning. You know, it is in your name, your name, that we gather, and it is your name that is honored from generation to generation. You alone are worthy of all glory and praise, and you are not shocked by the state of the world right now. Your ways are not our ways, and you are not at a loss about what to do, for, for nothing is impossible for you. So today, we are proclaiming that you will be glorified through this crisis, through this pandemic. That your name will be known and praised throughout the earth. Pierce the darkness with your light. Shine brighter than the fear of death, economic ruin, or long quarantine. When we look back on this moment in history, would we be filled with joy as we remember the revival, the hope, and the peace that came out of this season? Continue to draw this hurting world back to yourself. And we pray all of these things in the mighty, matchless name of Jesus Christ who taught his followers to pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. So this morning, as is often our custom here at Vihelia United Methodist Church, not every week, but it seems so appropriate for us again, collectively, as the people of God, to affirm who we are as people all across the town, the community, the county, the nation, Maybe even the world. This morning, we affirm our faith with many people from around the world, from many congregations and many denominations. We affirm it through the historical uh, creed known as the Apostles' Creed. So I want to invite you now, in whatever posture you are, I want to invite you.
invite you, if you're able to, and we have about eight or nine in the room here, our tech team and our praise team, I want to invite you to rise to your feet. And if you're at home and you can do that, you know who I'm talking to. You who are sitting in your lounge chairs. Get up out of your lounge chair for a minute. Rise to your feet and, and proclaim this to your dog or cat or wife or whomever. Proclaim this truth. Are you ready, folks? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He was raised from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining in that. Well, this morning, New Normal Week 2 for Bahia Methodist Church, I want to ask you to do this for me. If you have your Bibles handy, just hold your Bibles in your hand. You don't have to stay standing for this. It is our custom to do this every week, to affirm not only the Trinitarian God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but also His Holy Word. And so join me now. The Bible is true. The Bible is true. The Bible is true for me. The Bible is true for me. The truth of God's Word. The truth of God's Word. Changes the way I believe. Changes the way I believe. And I behave. So uh, this morning, I want to ask this question of you. What was the first prayer you ever remembered learning when you were a kid? It might have been that little bedtime prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And then you go through the, the blessings. God bless Mommy and God bless Daddy. Really wonderful and beautiful and appropriate prayer, is it not? We probably remember another really amazing prayer that has great truth to it. One that you might even still say from time to time, or if you have kids at the house, you hear this as well. God is great. God is good. Let us thank Him for our food. By His hand, we are fed. Thank you, God, for daily bread. I know you remember that, that uh, prayer. And it's a powerful one for us. It got, to me think, it got me to thinking about the greatness and goodness of God. We have one of our life group leaders, Diana Skufka. She says it often. She says, God is great and God is good. Sometimes we think that those two words mean the same things. But they don't always. And in this case, I don't think they do. I think there's something profound in both things. God is great and God is good. So this morning, we're going to look at what that that means for us, because honestly, I, I don't know about you, but I've had a lot of time to think about those things, um, the greatness of God and the goodness of God. What does that mean? And especially in light of this time, this season we're in, this global pandemic where over half a million people have now been infected and over 25,000 have died, around 2,200 in our, in our country. With the largest single infection in all the, all the world is in the United States of over 120, 24, 25,000 that have been now affected by this. Schools and businesses are closing, closed. Economic uh, uncertainty is rampant. Overworked uh, medical personnel, maybe understaffed. They don't have enough of their uh, PPEs and, and all of that. And we've got folks that are isolated. And isolation is such a, a difficult thing, especially for our elderly. And, and to, to be able to, to, to have physical touch is, uh, is lacking. And all of those things are, are affecting us. And how can we, under all of this, still say God is great and God is good? So I want to share a few things about the greatness and goodness of God. Let's talk about the greatness first. Look at some of his attributes. The first I'd like to mention is this, that God is majestic 
and holy. He's majestic and holy. That is to say, he's holy other. There is no one other than the one true living God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We just affirmed that in the Apostles' Creed that we just shared together. Psalm 8 begins and ends with these words. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The calling of Isaiah, you'll find this in Isaiah chapter 6. He's in the, the temple of, uh, of the Lord. And he, ha he has a vision. He sees the train of the robe of the Lord filling the temple. And smoke had filled the temple. And there were seraphim and they were flying around. And with, they had six wings. With two they covered their feet. With two they covered their eyes. And with two they flew. And they were singing the praises of God. And they were saying... Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. The weightiness of Almighty God is present. The word holy in Hebrew is kadosh. It means sacred, set apart. There is none other like God. He is holy. That same word in Greek is hagias. And it's spoken also in another throne room scene. We see in Revelation 4, almost at the, you know, from one end of the Bible to the other, we see this holiness of God. Again, four living creatures, they have wings, they're covering their feet, their faces, they're flying, and they're singing the same song. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. God is like none other. God is holy and majestic. Whether we confess this holiness of God or not. The heavens declare the glory of God. But by the way, we should confess it. So not only is God majestic and holy, God is sovereign. He is sovereign. In the Old Testament, the prophet Ezekiel often uses this name for, for God. Sovereign Lord, which is Yahweh Adonai. Turn to your neighbor, turn to your dog, and say, Yahweh Adonai. You should see this social distancing. We got like 15 feet from everybody in the room, and they're all saying that to each other. It's funny. After the Lord made this covenant with David through the prophet Nathan, uh, to the prophet Nathan, he had, he had told uh, David that he would establish his kingdom, his throne, forever. His offspring would, would actually... Be the fulfillment of that offspring would actually be Jesus Christ. After he told this, it's called the Davidic Covenant. This is what David replied. It was a beautiful thing. He said, Who am I? Sovereign Lord, Yahweh Adonai. And, and what is my family that you have brought me this far? And as if that were not enough in your sight, Sovereign Lord, you have spoken about the future of a house of your servant and this, de and this decree, Yahweh Adonai, is for a mere human? And in that same prayer, King David exclaims that there's no other God but Yahweh Adonai. To be sovereign is to have absolute authority and reign over one's realm, one's kingdom, one's domain. And in Revelation 6, we see that this image of the souls of the martyrs, the souls of those who have been killed but because of the word of the test, the word of God and the testimony, and, and they're they're actually asking a, a, a thing, asking something from God. They're saying, "How long, Sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? How long, O oh Lord?" I want to remind you that uh, in any given year, in any given year. There are over one million babies who are murdered through legalized abortion. I want to tell you, I believe that those martyrs, those martyrs that are under the altar, that image in, the, in Revelation 6, include the souls of those babies. How long, O oh Lord, till you avenge our blood? And they're told to rest a little longer. And I think some of us can relate to that, 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 that tension between Asking God, how long is this going to go on in my life? And hearing God say, you have to wait a little longer. How long, 
Yahweh Adonai. Until COVID-19 is eradicated and we can get back to life as normal and fill this room with, with worshipers in one space. How long, O oh Lord? How long, O oh Lord, until I can find work for, my, for me and my family or get back to work because of COVID-19? How long until cancer treatments actually do the trick for me? How long until, O oh Lord, until my child finally comes to his, her, her senses and she returns to you and to me as her father, her mother? How long, O oh Lord, until my marriage is mended or until I overcome this addiction? How long, O oh Lord? Well, you see, our God is great. Because he knows. Because he's sovereign. He's ruler over everything. Even if we don't see it. Even if circumstances around us don't show that. When we face impossible circumstances. You see God sees our situation. He understands our situation. And he knows our need even before we do. Which leads me to a third aspect. God's greatness. God is all-knowing. All-knowing. That is to say, He is omniscient. Remember when we talked a few weeks ago, it was about eight weeks ago in our service, we talked about the sanctity of human life. And we looked at Psalm 139, which describes the omniscience of God. I want to read for you a few of those verses from Psalm 139. The psalmist says, You have searched me, Lord. And you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thought, thoughts from far. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all of my ways. We just sang that in the good, good Father. You know my ways, oh God. Before a word was on my tongue, Lord. You knew it completely. Isn't it amazing that God knows exactly what I'm going to say and what you're going to hear before I even think it or say it? Before you think it or say it. Kind of scary. Sometimes. And the Lord goes up and he goes on to say, You hid me in, behind and before, and you laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. Too lofty for me to attain. The Gospels tell us that Jesus knew the thoughts of others on one occasion, he's explaining to them the incarnation. That is, that he came from the Father, and that he was returning to the Father. And we see that in John 16, 30, here's how the disciples responded. They said, now we can see that you know all things. You're omniscient. And that you do not even need to have anyone ask you any questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. His omniscience, his all-knowingness. Moved the followers to believe that in fact Jesus was the Son of God. God is all knowing. Finally, God is all powerful. All powerful, that is to say, He is omnipotent. When the, when the Lord had told Abraham and Sarah that they would be having a, ch a child in their old age, a year after they met, He had made this declaration, Sarah laughed. And the Lord kind of rebukes her on that. In fact, that's why Isaac's name is Isaac, because it means he laughs. And Sarah was told by um, the Lord this at the end. He said, is anything too hard for the Lord? So I'm going to ask you that question. You can answer it out loud in your, in your lounge chair or your bed or here in the room. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Can I hear that a little louder? No. That's nice. Those same words are spoken to the prophet Jeremiah. And, and then we look into the New Testament. We see this when the Virgin Mary was told that she would be with child by angel, the, uh, angel Gabriel. And he also says that your cousin, who is of great age, will also have a child. Gabriel decides to put on this tagline. He says this. For no word uh, from God will ever fail. No word. Say that to your dog. No word. No word will ever fail. And if you have a cat, you can say it to them too. 
God is all powerful. His word never fails. So God is great because he is holy and majestic. He is sovereign. He is all knowing and he is all powerful. Now, what do I mean when I say God is good? How is God good? Let me offer a few of those attributes. First, God is merciful and gracious. Merciful and gracious. Our opening song this morning was 10,000 Reasons. And it comes from Psalm 103. Let me read you the opening verses of that psalm. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity and heals all your diseases. Isn't that a good word for us, especially in this time of this pandemic, that he heals all our diseases and he forgives all of our iniquity, our sin. But then the psalmist goes on to say in, in verse 8, he says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. We see that word spoken over and over again in the Old Testament. But it's also in the New Testament. In the second chapter of Ephesians, for instance, we find one of the greatest explanations of the gospel, of the truth. Of the gospel, and I want to just read this for you. It comes from uh, first, excuse me, Second Corinthians, the first ten verses. If you have your Bibles, you can crack that open with me. It won't be on the screen, but hear these words from Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler. Of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following the desires and, and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. And here's the, the, the turning. The hint, hinge pin, if you will, of this whole pa passage. He says this. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our, transgression, our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Now, I want you to pay attention to the past tense of this next phrase. As if it had already happened, here's what the Holy Spirit tells us. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. As if it had already happened. This is the hope we have, folks. He goes on to say, in order... That in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, mercy and grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This, I will say, as I would often say in all the texts we have said, is God's word for God's people this morning. We see here that all of us were dead in our sins at one time. And some of us still are. We have not become quickened and alivened to the power of God through the presence of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. It is God who is rich in mercy and because of His great love for us made us alive in Christ even before we could do anything about it. We were dead in our sin. We deserve death. Eternal separation from God. 
But He is so good. He offered us a way to salvation through His Son, Jesus. It's the sole reason we are who we are as the people of God. It is it. There is none other. There is none other but Jesus Christ. You see, God poured the wrath that we deserve on Him, His Son, on the cross. And in so doing, the wrath was satisfied. The debt was paid. All of this was unmerited. We didn't earn it. It's grace. It's grace. God is loving and God is merciful. A second attribute I want us to, to talk about this morning about the goodness of God is His forgiveness. God is forgiving. In the opening praise of Paul's letter to the church of Ephesus, he writes this, In Him, meaning Jesus, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us. Through the death of God's one and only Son, Jesus Christ, God offers forgiveness of all who accept and receive this grace by faith. It is unmerited favor. The writer of Hebrews quotes Jeremiah 31, 34 in speaking of a time when God's law would be written on the hearts of all the men and women whose hearts are quickened by the power, the life-giving power of Jesus and when God's gracious gift, and he didn't call it Jesus, there was a time, you see, with the, with the prophets, you're speaking of a time that's imminent in their time, and also a time that is to come. Which sometimes is our time, and sometimes it's yet to come. Like in the prophet Daniel, for instance, and other places. But in this case, in this case he speaks of a time the prophet Jeremiah of a time when, his pe when the people of Israel would be forgiven of their sins and return back to their homeland, to the promised land. But it's also a foreshadowing of another time when God would write a new law on our hearts, a new word on our hearts. And the Hebrew, the writer of Hebrews in the New Testament says this in Hebrews 8.12, I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Why? Because of the blood of Jesus Christ. God is forgiving. He is merciful. He is gracious. Finally, a third attribute I want to mention is that He is not only forgiving, but He is giving. He is giving. Turn to your neighbor and your cat. He is giving. Thank you. I heard it in the room. The Apostle Paul, when he was writing from prison to the church of Philippi, he encouraged them with these words. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. You see, Paul realized that the Philippians, who had sent out of their scarcity resources to help him while he was in prison in Rome, he wanted to remind them that, they, that God would still provide for their needs just as Paul had been provided for out of the needs, out of, uh, because of his needs, out of the abundance, or I should say the scarcity, of the people in Philippi. God is giving. See, it's never a question about resources. It's about allocation of resources. God owns a cattle on a thousand hills. You know, that reminds me of that, that song from the, the Rolling Stones. You can't always get what you want. But if you try sometimes, you get what you need. Amen. Well, it's not us trying. It's God providing. God provides. He clothes the lilies of the field and the birds of the air. How much more, beloved, will he take care of you and me? God is giving. Our God is good. He is good all by himself because he is rich in mercy. He is gracious. He is forgiving. And he is giving. So, what is our response to this great God? who is so good. To me, it kind of seems obvious. It comes, frankly, from the Word of God. When we look at the, the letter of Galatians in the fifth chapter, we look at the fruit of the Spirit. If we have Christ dwelling in us, we have the fruit of the Spirit that God gives us through the presence of His Spirit. And among those that we also see in 1 Corinthians are faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love. We could talk about a lot of things, a lot of responses, but I want to just talk about those three things for just a minute. Our response to God, 
because he is great, because he is good, first and foremost, is faith. Is faith. The, the faith means believing in the promises of God that they will come to pass even if we can't see it. Even our, our circumstances right now look otherwise. That's what faith is. Hope. Hope is the confident expectation of what is certain. And we looked at that last week, what hope was. Namely, that God loves us and that all things work together for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purposes. One other uh, rather lengthy passage I want to read to you. Quite appropriate, and I've been seeing it a lot uh, out on, on the uh, social media this week and the last week, a number of weeks. And that comes from Romans chapter 8, beginning in the 31st verse. I'm going to read these to you. I may stop and say something about it, may not. I may even paraphrase a little bit. See if you're watching. See if you're listening. Open your Bibles. Look at Romans 8, 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, then who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? There's that giving father. Who will bring any charges against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. He makes right, just as if we had never sinned. It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus raised to life at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. He is like the defense attorney standing before the judge and says, Judge, I will prove to you that they are no longer guilty. Why? Because of my blood shed on the cross. He is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword or pandemic, COVID-19, economic meltdown, stock market crashes? Shall anything in all creation separate us? As, the, as it is written, for the sake, for your sake, we have faced death all day long. We are considered as sheep among, to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, or demons, or thing, or neither the, excuse me, neither the present, nor the future, neither the powers, neither height or death or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Can I get an amen? amen. This is the truth of God's word. And as a result of that, our response is hope, confident expectation of what is certain and love, love that he has, faith, hope, and love. Because of this great gift that we've been given, our response is love. He loves us. And love for me is the work for me. Love is the worship and obedience of God regardless of our circumstances. I've got to be honest with you without stating any details. And it has nothing to do about the coronavirus. We've been through trying times in my family very recently. Very difficult times tumultuous times. And sometimes, quite honestly, it just did not feel right. It didn't feel good. God didn't feel great. Have you ever been there? Have you ever experienced that time where you have this worry, anxiety, frustration, depression, and things just don't feel right? I know you have. We all have. But that's not what true love is about. When I married Cassie, Almost 30 years ago, my declaration to her, and she's in the room, my declaration to her was not that I would feel love every time I'm with her or when I think about her. My declaration was this, that I would, uh, that I would be faithful to her, that my covenant with her, to love her, to honor her, to cherish her, always, forever. As long as we're alive, sick as in health, rich or poor, all that stuff, until death will do us part. That is a covenant of faithful love. That's what it's all about. That's the same kind of love God has for us. He might not always like the things we do, but
But he has a covenant faithful love to us. He is abounding in love, steadfast. And we, our response is the same. Regardless of how we feel, we remain steadfast and love him. I want to call Praise Him more on up as we consider, we kind of head out today. You see, if we base our view on who God is, if we base our worship of Him simply on our current circumstances, then we might as well turn off our Lauren Dangle on our on our our, 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 our uh, I had a name coming to my mind and just just let me, huh? Oh, I thought you had it, Chris Conlon or something like that. We close our Bibles. We would start binge watching Netflix. But something tells me differently today because you chose to be here on Facebook Live. You chose to be in worship with this community today. That tells me something that you are not looking at the mountain of anxiety and worry and, and uncertainty in your life. That's not who you are. You're looking at the mountain mover. You're looking at the mountain mover and saying, God, you are still good and you are still great. And your response as a lover of God, your response is, is to... Give to others, to forgive others who have offended you in whatever way, to be sacrificial in your love, to pick up the phone and call your neighbors, your friends, your family, and connect with them and make sure they're okay, providing in all the ways you can. These are aspects of God's goodness and God's love through us. This is the call we have as followers of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to ask you today, in your heart, do you know it? That God is great and that God is good. Let's worship.
Holy Spirit. 